Cool. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, oh, maybe I should, uh, sorry. So hello everyone. Um, my name is Anju Wu. Uh, welcome to the talk today. Um, I'm very honored um, to have the chance to present my work, which has had been done with Jonathan Pillow at Princeton. Um, and thanks um, Jean Pascal for inviting me here. And the topic is um, new methods for identifying latent and manifold structure from neural data. Okay, so first let me first let me talk about this uh, latent manifold idea. Um, sorry, just I don't know why it's just, just don't stretch. Okay, so first let me present this latent manifold idea. Latent here means unobserved or hidden. Um, and if we ask, can we um, find some continuous low dimensional structure underlying high dimensional spectrum data? And the latent manifold idea tells us that, yeah, the answer could be true. So um, the reason we have this hypothesis is because um, there are many examples um, showing that there exists um, some low dimensional dynamics underlying multiple cortices in the brain. And these dynamics are the, the latent temporal structures. And here I'm showing a motivating simulated example uh, why this is true. Here is a simulation of three artificial neurons. Neuron one um, spikes are in blue, neuron two spikes are in red, and neuron three spikes are in yellow. If we look at these spike trains, it's not obvious that um, there is any low dimensional structure underlying them. Um, moreover, if we do PCA on them and um, to find, try to find some linear dimensionality and we can find that there's roughly an equal amount of variance in all dimensions, meaning that I could read or I can need a three dimensional space um, to capture the responses of these three neurons. However, I generated this simulation by creating a set of fan rates, uh, one fan rate for each neuron, uh, which are shown here. And the blue trace is the fan rate of the blue neuron, the red trace is the fan rate of the red neuron, et cetera. We can now plot these fan rates in a three-dimensional fan rate or state space. The first axis is the fan rate of first neuron, and the second axis is the fan rate of second neuron, and et cetera. And you can see this black ball, which actually indicates the instantaneous fan rate of the three neurons in this three-dimensional fan rate space. What you notice that um, is the fan rate lie along a curved one-dimensional manifold, and it goes out along the neuron one axis, curves around, and ends along the third axis, which is the third neuron. So the fan rates are not really three-dimensional. They are one-dimensional curved um, trajectory into a 3D space of fan rate, okay? So the way these fan rate data were generated is actually from a one-dimensional latent variable X. You can think of this as an animal's position in a one-dimensional linear track. And each neuron has a Gaussian bump shaped um, tuning curve. And as this X vari variable moves along um, the track, we look up the fan rate of each neuron, and that's what determines the point in this 3D rate space. Okay, so this example tells us that using PCA, you can find three effective dimensions, but there exists actually a one-dimensional trajectory generating these, motivate, uh, these, spike, these spikes, which, are un, which is unobservable. Um, we resort to some nonlinear dimensionality reduction method to discover such a low structure, given only the spectrum data. But how we construct such a model, and we build it um, in a Bayesian way. So let's denote the latent by X and the spectrum by Y. A Bayesian approach usually assumes a prior distribution over X and a probabilistic mapping PY given X. The task is to infer the latent X and the mapping PY given X. Um, and then as long as we know the probabilistic mapping, 
given an arbitrary x star on this low dimension manifold, we can obtain its vector of Poisson fan rates, Py given x star. Um, formally, we can write the marginal probability Py as the integral of Py given x multiplying Px over x. Okay, so, um, um, sorry, I'm keep trying to. So here is the latent manifold tuning model. Um, why is this flash? Sorry, just a second. I'm, I'm trying to adjust the window a little bit. Um, anyway, so here is a more detailed description, description of the model, which is the latent manifold tuning model. And, and here is the spectrum Y. Our target is to learn some low dimensional uh, process X, underlying X, uh, underlying Y. As mentioned, um, there are typical two components in a Bayesian framework. Um, the first is the prior over X, which we assume is to be a, X to be a function of time T. And we use a Gaussian process as the prior for X. Okay, Gaussian process is some distribution you can use to generate smooth functions. Therefore, with such a prior, um, the generate X could be a smooth function of time T, and thus it has the temporal continuity. Um, and the second component is the probabilistic mapping PY given X that maps the latent X to the spectrum Y. We assume the mapping is also achieved um, it is, first, we assume that the mapping is achieved via some nonlinear tuning curves f. And f is a function with um, the latent variable as the input and spec rate as the output. So due to the non-negativity constraint of the tuning curves, we put a Gaussian process prior over the log of f. Again, um, this Gaussian process can generate smooth tuning curves, ensuring that the, fan rate, the, fan, the neurons fare smoothly in the latent space. Okay, so then the output from the tuning curves are the spike rates lambda. And finally, we generate the spike counts um, given, an uh, given this fan rate lambda. So now given this generative model, we could generate the spike counts given an arbitrary latent variable. For a time point t, we have a latent variable xt, input xt into the tuning curves, for all neurons to generate spike rates at time t. Okay, and then we get this vector of spike rates at time t, and finally, um, we generate a vector of spike counts from um, this, this spike rates. To do the inference, we can write down the marginal distribution py as the integral of these terms over the latent x and the tuning curves f. So where PY is the marginal probability for all spikes, it's an integral of PY given X, PY, PF and PX. So PY given F here, uh, PY given F and X here is the likelihood function um, for the Poisson probability of all spikes across all neurons and spike and time points. Uh, PF is the um, GP prior over the log of tuning curve. And then uh, Px is the GP prior over the latent path. So we want to do this multi, we, we want to do the integral here and to infer um, the model hyperparameters. And finally, we infer the, the latent x and the tuning curve f. However, um, the inference itself is intractable. We propose a new variant of um, Laplacian approximation here. Um, which is called decoupled Laplacian approximation. To, we, um, we use it to evaluate PY given X by approximately integrating over the tuning curves F. And then finally to infer X, we just use the, or, or the, the general MAP estimator, the maximum a posterior estimator conditioned on X. And we can get a closed form solution for F as well due to the Gaussian um, due, due to the Gaussianality. Okay, so this is the inference of the model. Here we show an application of this latent manifold tuning model with a Mobius strip example. 
here is the true Mobius strip we can generate um, in a 3D space as the simulated example. We generate then 3D trajectory on this Mobius uh, manifold and the three axes are plot on the right here. We also generate um, tuning curves for each neuron on this Mobius strip. And finally, we generate um, spike counts or spike trains using the Poisson spiking model for all neurons. So this is um, how we generate from a 3D Mobius strip to the spike trains. But when we infer the model, as we emphasize again, as we emphasized before, we only have the Poisson spiking data. If we fit PCA, and this is what we recover, on the left is the plot for the accumulated variance as we have more PCs. Um, we need way more than three PCs to capture 90% variance of the data. And we can plot the first of three PCs, which certainly doesn't look like a Mobius strip. Um, well, here is a, um, the inferred latent from the LMT model, we can plot the three axes against the true manifold. And we can also plot the um, linear, uh, we, we can also plot the uh, result from a linear dynamic system fit. The linear dynamic system just assumes a linear dynamics over the latent X and a linear mapping from the latent to the spike counts or the spike train. We can see um, the first two dimensions are fit perfectly, but the linear model misses the third dimension, which is the hard one in this Mobius strip example. Okay. Um, next, I'm showing here an application of the LMT model to a rat hippocampal data set. Um, and I will show the latent process and the tuning curves estimated from the data. The data set is um, from Lauren Frank's lab, which consists of 7 to 35 simultaneously recorded neurons. Um, here is an example of spike trains for 31 neurons for 15-minute recording session. If we do principal component analysis on the spike train data, we will get at least 10 principal components capturing a significant percent of the total variance of the data. Okay, we can fit um, a 2D latent manifold tuning model to it, to it, which captures almost 60% of the variance, which has to be um, captured by four principal components. Um, here are the two latent dimensions with it. The X axis um, is the time, and the Y axis is a correspond to the two dimensions. We know that the red is actually traversing in this W-shaped maze, and thus, when we can plot the real-time trajectory in this 2D space too, we have to align the yellow trajectory onto the coordinate space with an Einstein uh, transformation. Then we can see that our latent trajectory overlays on top of the black trajectory, and this provides a nice interpretation for our latent discovery. And this is also consistent with our knowledge about place cells that um, they usually encode the 2D spatial locations. We can also plot the tuning curves or the place, uh, place fills for four example neurons. The top row is the empirical tuning curve at the true locations, and the bottom row is the estimated tuning curves at the estimated 2D locations in this latent space. Okay, so now I have shown the, the latent we estimated and also the tuning curves, which, which are X and F. These are the two critical variables we care about um, from the model. So a, a, a summary of this latent manifold tuning model is we propose a doubly nonlinear latent variable model uh, for spike train data. It's defined by two Gaussian process. One is for the latent dynamic, the other is for the tuning curve. Um, and it's, it is good for extracting low dimensional nonlinear manifolds, which is the, the 2D correspond to the 2D trajectories for play cells. And it's also good to recover smooth tuning curves for individual neurons. Okay, so this is just an example shows the cap capability of the latent manifold tuning model um, to discover something that we have already have some knowledge about. Okay, more like a proof of concept. 
Next, I'm going to show that the latent manifold tuning the latent manifold tuning model could discover something that we don't yet have much knowledge about. So this is um, this is the uh, another application, which is to identify a low dimensional perceptual space underlying olfactory perception in mouse with only neural response. So usually people don't have much knowledge about olfactory perception because olfactory neurons in piriform cortex don't have the nice spatial topography as visual cortex neurons. Okay, so the data was collected by our collaborators Bob Data Lab, Bob Data Lab at Harvard. They simultaneously recorded um, neural responses to odorants in layer three, at uh, layer two and three of piriform cortex via multi-photon microscopy in the wake and semi-paralyzed mice. So here I'm showing the raw calcium imaging data they collect from the from piriform cortex. And we have to reformulate the data to get the raw neural response we analyze. So here is the raw data we analyze. It's a matrix of neural response. Um, here we don't have the temporal information for each neuron. We average the neural response across a window over the time after the set on of the stimulus. So each row of this matrix corresponds to the population response to a single odorant. Okay, so again, we apply a very similar model as we previously shown, but without the temporal component, the model still consists of a low dimensional latent order space and a nonlinear mapping from the latent to the neural response, which is defined as the tuning curve. And the goal is, um, again, given the neural response data, we want to find such low dimensional later order, latent order and locations and the tuning curves that account for the population response together. Okay, so the model we propose is still a latent manifold tuning model, but with structure noise. Um, the latent manifold tuning model is very similar to the previous one. I'll talk about the structure noise later. Okay, first let's start with the low dimensional latent representation. Um, it's denoted by X. Notice that we don't have the um, dynamic assumptions over X right now. Thus, instead of having a GP prior, we assume just a normal prior over X. And each order rent here has its own X. So J is the index for the order for the Jth order uh, for the Jth order rent. And then um, we, we still have the tuning curves, which is denoted as f of x. We also assume f of x is from a Gaussian process prior with a smoothing kernel k. Again, um, GP can generate smooth functions. So with such a prior, we can generate um, smooth tuning curves, which are more biologically interpretable. Here we don't have the log there because we don't have the heart constraint on the neg non-negativity of the of the tuning curve because um, the, the, the signal we analyze is Gaussian, which is not um, strictly positive or non-negative. Okay, now given one order's latent representation, we generate a uh, neural response for each neuron uh, like this. We have this latent location, we input the latent location um, into the neuron tuning curves and we get a mean response from all neural populations for this specific orderant, and we can repeat the same procedure for all, all the, for all the orders to get the neural population response for all the orderants. But this is not the final raw data we observe, right? In order to get the observed um, neural response, as we show in the beginning, we need to add some Gaussian noise to the mean response. The noise consists of two components. Sigma x is the order um, dependent variance and epsilon is the neural correlated Gaussian noise. And this is, this two multiplying together is what we called structure noise. Usually people use IID noise from a Gaussian, which we refer to independent noise, but here we, we refer this to structure noise. 
Okay, just to remind you, our goal is to infer the latent location of each odorant and the tuning curves using only the observed neural response. Next, I'm going to show some um, latent embeddings and tuning curves we estimate from an olfactory data set. Um, before we dive into the latent representation of this um, neural data, let me briefly show that uh, what the stimuli or the odorants look like. Here is the stimulus design. The odorants are represented by thousands of chemical features. And our collaborators project these thousands of chemical features down to a 2D um, PC space. Then to select 22 odorants that span a particular region of the first two PC dimensions of this chemical space. The first PC corresponds to the increase in carbon chain length, and the second PC corresponds to the chemical functional groups. The set of odorants spans um, four different functional groups, which are indicated by the colors here. Uh, within each group, the carbon chain length of the molecule is incrementally varied. So this is the topography of the order set in the chemical space, which is unaccessible to the modeling procedure. All we have are the neural responses given different odorants. We first um, applied PCA to the neural response, and we can find 22 principal components. Here I'm just showing the 2D plot with the first two PCs. And here I'm showing um, the LMT model estimate with the 2D latent. First, we can see the accumulated variance capture by two dimensions is almost one 100% um, compared with PCA. And second, we can see uh, we discovered some interesting latent representations of these odorants resembling their true structure in the chemical space. Odors sharing the same functional group exhibit this line-shaped structure in the data set. Okay, moreover, within each line structure, the ordering of these odorants is the same as their ordering in the chemical space. So this gives nice interpretations of our latent representation. Um, the x-axis indicates the functional group and the y indicates the carbon chain length. Thank you. I think you should quickly summarize uh, such that we have enough time for questions. Okay, I'm, I'm very, okay. One minute, one minute left. Okay. okay, sorry. So just quick thing is, one thing we can do um, using the latent and the tuning curve is to, to validate whether the single neuron data is generated by these two components. One thing we can do is taking an example neuron and we place this two, uh, 22 odorants latent representation onto the tuning curve for this neuron and generate the mean response. The x-axis is the odorant index, the y-axis is the mean response, and the solid bars are the true response that we observe, and the light bars are the predicted response. Comparing them together, we can see they match each other pretty well. They're saying our model can well explain the data. We can also use it to assess the prediction performance on unseen data or on unseen odorants. We can first predict the latent location of a test order using some other neurons used with a method called cross-validation or co-smoothing. We then place this test odorant um, onto the tuning curve for this neuron. This neuron has never seen this test order and get the predicted neural response and comparing them together. We finally collect this R square value of the predicted response to header orders for all neurons and plot this um, figure, the x-axis is PCA, the y-axis is the latent magnitude for tuning curve uh, model. We show the comparison for the independent noise model. We can see LMT has already outperformed PCA. We also plot the, the LMT with the structure noise, which further improved the R-squared performance. Okay, so a quick summary of this LMT with structure noise model on the olfactory data is we successfully extract a low dimensional olfactory manifold. From neural response alone, we identify neural curves, neural tuning curves over manifold, which are smooth and interpretable. We finally predict the neural response to head on neuron uh, and header orders. 
and, and we see that LMT with structural noise has the best performance, um, best predictive performance. Okay, so finally, I want to thank my PhD advisor, Jonathan Pillow, and my co-authors and collaborators. Um, so thank you very much. I'm happy to take any question. Okay, thanks, Anki, for this uh, wonderful talk on the GP latent viable models. Um, so actually, your talk gave a lot of questions. So maybe I'll just take okay. the first one from Dimitri Todorov. So if you were to generate a more noisy trajectory, but still within this uh, Möbius strip, would it still work as well? That's a good question. So the model largely depends on, so the model um, de basically has two components. One is the data, the other is the prior. Um, the data part, if you have very noisy data, of course your model performance will drop. Like you will not successfully estimate the, um, the, late, the latent. Um, and that's why we have the noise term that account for the noise. But yeah, of course, if you have very noisy data, there's no model or no tool can recover things. But if the noise is within the control, um, the noise term we had could account for that part. And thus the data part will be um, better estimated. So yeah. Okay, yes, great. And then another one from uh, Wilhelm Brown. You know, what is the relationship between your latent ma manifold uh, tuning model and the um, an autoencoder, you know, to generate spike fit? You, you could also have an autoencoder. So a general, a typical autoencoder doesn't account temporal information. They take static input, they, ha they learn a latent representation. Um, and if you want to account for the dynamics, you have to build um, variational autoencoder with temporal information or with dynamics over the latent. There are models has, uh, have been built already to do that. The main difference is if, if the, um, I actually have a chart just comparing my model with other uh, state of art methods, but I, I didn't get the chance to put it here. But the main difference between my model and other state of art model is we heavily rely on GP, but all most of other models use um, um, use neural network as the mapping and they use uh, assume not only uh, they assume linear dynamics for uh, the latent but actually um, Manish had um, a work on GP um, dynamic model that they use GP function to model the dynamic which is a bit different from mine but uh, um, still it's a very interesting work but to answer that question yeah basically um, there is model doing variational autoencoder with temporal dynamics as well. Um, but we heavily re rely on GP um, yeah. due to some reasons that a GP can outperform a neural network when the data is small and it counts the noise better or, or it, it can well deal with the uncertainty in the data and so forth, so. Okay, so maybe just in the last 20 seconds, uh, just a question from Anna Kutcherreiter. So, Okay. So how do you know uh, that the underlying dimensionality of the order uh, variable is only two? You know, you have to make an assumption of the dimensionality of the latent variable. So how do you do Yeah, it? so this is a really good question. I have a backup slide to answer that. I, I've been confronted with this question for many times. So here in, in the spectrum data, in the example I'm showing, I'm only showing two. Like we predefined the number of latent to be two. But of course we know that there could be higher dimensions. Um, which like hippocampus data might not just include the encode the spatial location, but also head orientation and all this stuff. So when we really fit the model, I have more figures here showing that we actually fit different number of latent dimensionality from one, two, three, four. And for this specific data, we use some cross validation type of thing and evaluate the test likelihood. We show that three is actually the best um, number that give us the best a predictive performance. So uh, empirically, we should evaluate the number of the latent dimensionality using some more rigorous cross-validation method. And here I'm showing the 3D traject LMT trajectory okay. and the manifold yes. of the 3D latent. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank that was a, a really brilliant talk. If I can ask you to stop sharing your screen.